Well, thank you all for coming today. Um, it's my pleasure to uh, introduce the next speaker in our uh, series, uh, Rethinking Public Religion in Africa and South Asia, uh, Professor Isabel Hoffmeyer. Um, it's a real pleasure to have you here. Um, professor Hoffmeyer is Professor of African Literature at Witts University in Johannesburg. Uh, she's also the Global Distinguished Professor at New York University, which she visits uh, every other year uh, to teach in the English department. Um, she has a PhD in uh, literature from Witts from 1992, uh, and she's the author or editor of numerous works. Um, one a fairly recent co-edited book, uh, which brings together uh, the interests of this project very well, is um, South Africa and India, Shaping the Global South. Um, she's also the author of some fantastic monographs, including The Portable Bunyan, um, A Transnational History of the Pilgrim's Progress, which was published in 2004. And we spend our years as a tale that is told, oral historical narrative in South African chief. Now it's this last book, um, We Spend Our Years <coughs> as a Tale That Is Told, um, the title taken, if I recall, from the Book of Psalms. Um, it's this last book, her first, which was published in 1994, that I first came across as uh, a student. And it struck me then, as it does now, as one of the finest treatments of the ways in which oral narrative and textual traditions can be woven together, expressing a variety of cultural, religious, gendered, and other concerns, commitments, and problematics. Uh, this interest in uh, the history of texts and the relationship between morality and literacy was carried forward in her second monograph, The Portable Bunyan, which is also pathbreaking in my view, for its careful attention to how the circulation of written texts can be taken up <coughs> in colonial context here uh, in Africa, as well as missionary fields. Now, if this work on print culture and oral narratives defined her earliest interests, it also makes its mark, at least in part, on work that she's been doing um, over the past 15 to 20 years. Um, looking in particular at how we can situate South Africa in relation to the broader currents, uh, literal and figurative, in the global south. Uh, here, um, Professor Hoffmeyer, through her work on Southern Africa and South Asia, has played a formative role in the development of Indian Ocean studies. Um, so uh, it's, again, a pleasure to have you here with us uh, all the way from, uh, from Greenwich Village today. Um, and uh, Isabel is going to speak on custom house, copyright, censorship, hydrocolonial formation. So please join me in welcoming Isabel. Um, uh, my thanks to Matthew for this invitation to be here and to Mariana for her ass assistance. Um, and uh, thank you all for coming. It's a, it's a great pleasure to be here. And also, if I can just say, th um, this photograph is from Esther Brock El Ansari, who's an um, Omani photographer who does a lot of underwater work. Um, so just to acknowledge that. Okay, so my talk this evening is drawn from a book that I'm desperately trying to complete, entitled Hydro-Colonialism, Coast, Custom House, and Dockside Reading. The project began in the wake of my previous monograph, Gandhi's printing press experiments in slow reading. One minor theme that emerged was Gandhi's steadfast opposition to copyright, which he regarded as a form of private property. Having completed the book, I wanted to investigate this thread further. Was Gandhi's position unusual or not? What was the position with colonial copyright? Rather unexpectedly, this search led me to, the cust to customs and excise, since it was this department that had overseen copyright. Printed matter coming out from outside any colony had to pass through the port city where customs officials checked to see that it was not pirated, seditious, obscene, or in some parts of the world, blasphemous. Customs, hence, became the part of the colonial state that oversaw both copyright and censorship. 
I sought out the customs archive in South Africa with some trepidation, expecting dry and tedious reports on, tax on taxation and tariffs. Instead, I found a completely fascinating archive teeming with objects, in some cases actual ones, like swatches of fabric, labels of tinned condensed milk, uh, packets of seeds, um, and the documents accompanying these were largely filled with arguments about what these items actually were. Was a substance butter or margarine? Was there a difference between tea and medicinal herbs? Was a young pilchard the same thing as a sardine? Customs officials, it turned out, were a species of dockside ontologist. Now, had I done this project 10 or 15 years ago, I would no doubt have written a drier book, only on the print culture implications of copyright and censorship in the custom house, without considering its coastal or littoral location. While Gandhi's printing press had located itself in the field of Indian Ocean Studies, uh, like much scholarship on the ocean, there was not much actual sea involved. Instead, the ocean featured as a backdrop for human movement at sea, more surface than volumetric depth. Over the last decade, rising sea levels and climate catastrophe have impacted powerfully on oceanic studies itself, which now grapples with how to go below the waterline and to engage with the materialities and ecologies of the marine world. The book I'm writing is an attempt to embed print culture in this new oceanic studies, to put water and paper closer together. The book itself focuses on Southern African customs, copyright and censorship. And this is set in the framework of what I call hydro-colonialism. My talk this evening will draw together sections of this book. We'll begin underwater off the port city of Durban, and I'm sure this audience doesn't really need this map, but <laughs> here it is. Um, um, we'll start underwater and then move on to land to consider the daily protocols of the Custom House and how these shape their views of books and reading. Um, and then also trying to understand how these practices in turn shaped ideas of copyright. And that'll take up most of the time. So then I'll very telegrammatically and in the interest of time, I'll touch only very briefly on censorship. I'll summarize some of the key points of this idea in hydro-colonialism, and I'll make, honestly, a very th few throwaway remarks on how this material might relate uh, to public religion, as I belatedly read my abstract and saw that I had promised this. <laughs> um, okay, so let's start underwater. The second chapter of Oran Pamuk's novel, The Black Book, takes the form of a newspaper column entitled When the Bosphorus Dries Up. The Black Sea, we are told, is heating up, the Mediterranean cooling down, caught between the Bosphorus empties. The residents of Istanbul face a festering bog dotted with artifacts, muscle-encrusted uh, Byzantine treasures, bottle tops, moss-covered cuckoo clocks, coffee grinders, and a Cadillac amidst the skeleton of galley slaves and, quote, barnacle-covered crusaders. The receding waters uncover different ages, Byzantine, Crusader, Ottoman, and the Republic, all chaotically in intermingl intermingled. Pamuk's chapter might usefully be taken as a speculative method for thinking about other port cities. So let's attempt such an experiment in relation to the, to, uh, to the Indian Ocean port city of Durban. For most of its length, uh, the, the, the littoral along here, the, you know, of, of the southern and east African coast is flanked by a very narrow continental shelf. However, just about 200 kilometers north of Durban, the continental shelf bulges out and then tucks back in immediately south of the city. And if you look at the very, very pale blue bit next to the coastline, you can see that. Uh, Durban, hence, has an unusually generous continental margin, or in oceanographic terms, a terrace-like bathymetry. What detritus might we expect to find on this terrace? So let's posit a date somewhere in the 1890s when the most prominent waste would have been shipwrecks, 
the entrance to Durban Harbour had long been blocked by a sandbar with most ships having to anchor in the roadstead. Conditions were so perilous that Lloyd's was reluctant to ensure vessels sailing to Durban. By the 1890s, however, the sandbar was being regularly drenched and Durban had become an important deep water port, handling ever increasing volumes of cargo to supply the burgeoning gold mining city of Johannesburg in the interior. The port personnel expanded, including those in the custom house, who from time to time added to the waste on the terrace by dumping unclaimed commodities or seized goods uh, three miles out to sea. So rifles, perished sand shoes, jewellery, cigars and umbrellas were pitched into the ocean. Another form of debris would have been the ritual paraphernalia from religious festivals. Durban was home to an Indian diaspora community which cere celebrated a range of religious events. As part of the an annual Muharram festival, indentured workers, both Hindu and Muslim, uh, immersed highly decorated tazias, 15 to 20 foot high pagoda-like structures, and saving only the bamboo frame uh, for the following year. Hindu deities like Ganesh might have been immersed as part of Visarjan ceremonies. Retired statuettes of God and, God and goddesses used for domestic wor worship might also have had a submarine ending. Decommissioned religious images could not be thrown away but had to be returned to nature. This submarine pantheon was not solely Indian. For African societies on the eastern seaboard, the ocean was the realm of the ancestors. In Zulu cosmology, the sea housed the ancestors and was hence a place of pilgrimage, healing, training as a diviner, and inversions of African Christianity, baptism. Many of these items, religious or otherwise, would not have lasted beyond a few days, battered by current, corroded by salt, and consumed by microbes. Yet adopting Pamuk's conceit, let's imagine for a moment um, that they all survived in some form. Or to, bar or to borrow another term from oceanography, we could line them up on an isobath, which is a line on a map that connects all points having the same depth below the water surface. So th these, ob these objects obviously did not come to rest at the same depth, but in terms of their analytical consequence, we might imagine them as doing so and as, as forming an intellectual contour. The religious paraphernalia might suggest a contour of submarine cosmopolitanism created by the metaphysical presences implied in the physical remains or projected onto the ocean. You know, Hindu deities, the, afterline of, uh, the afterlives of Hussein, commemorated in the Muharram festival, Zulu ancestors, or in the case of shipwrecks, the spirit of British imperialism, replete with the romance of maritime adventure stories, in the case of shipwrecks gone badly wrong, but even in its failure, adding to the mystique of the ocean. The goods dumped by customs <coughs> might constitute another contour, this time of port city government and its regulation, which reached below the waterline. Although the two contours might at times have, might cross, since both involve decommissioning of objects via the ocean. In one case, household gods put to rest, and in the other, commodities that could not be sanctified for the market. Okay, let's move now above the waterline to the dockside where customs officials pursued their business of generating revenue for the colonial state by imposing tariffs on incoming and outgoing cargo. As the earliest form of colonial port city governance, customs inevitably with their uniforms, um, and this is an Australian picture, with their flags and their rituals had long embodied the state, striving to make it seem larger and more permanent than it was. Port cities aimed to pave the ocean and assert sovereignty over the conjuncture of land and sea. Yet they are uncertain places, both ecologically and epidemiologically. Customs officials worked in the clamor of the waterfront and its imbroglio of incoming cargo. These commodities might be diseased, putrefying, contaminated, seditious, obscene, illegal, or counterfeit. The hold of a vessel hummed with microbes, weevily maize, rotting cargo, dogs, parrots, reptiles, cattle, both dead and alive. 
Ships burped bilge water, they extruded diseased human bodies, they deposited animal carcasses, they secreted seditious pamphlets and obscene objects and disgorged um, quote unquote undesirable aliens. The ship was an indeed an ark of nuisances, a term from sanitary inspection much beloved of port authorities. This epidemiological risk of the colonial port city was matched by an ecological uncertainty. In smaller British colonial ports um, and in the early history of larger ones, customs houses, in some cases no more than tents, perched precariously on sand spits or next to rickety wharves where they were engulfed by sand and flooded by tidal rivers. As ports expanded, customs houses became more confident in style and moved uh, in size and moved further away from the waterfront atop reclaimed land. So just here, two shots of Durban. This is Durban in about the 1870s. You can see it's all a sort of fairly precarious and rickety affair. Um, and that's about a shot from the 1890s. Um, and the custom house is the building sort of with a, with a cupola at the top. It even shifted back from the waterline, the ecology of the port insinuated itself into the buildings. Constructed on landfall, the Sydney Custom House straddled the erstwhile high water mark, which continued to haunt the building with persistent damp. Job titles in the custom servants, like tide waiter, tide sprayer, beach magistrate, and receiver of wrecks, pointed to a dependence on time, tide, and the vagaries of the ocean. Port cities remain uncertain places. How could one know with any certainty that things on the dockside were what they seemed? An Irish pauper about to be deported might give her jailers the slip. On the ship itself, a bogus Armenian cleric might be pulling the wool over the eyes of an immigration official. A recently disembarked Lascar might slip a second-hand garment to an African dock worker, part of an established trade between these two groups. Like people, objects too could dissemble. Might a walking stick in fact be a lethal weapon? Could a shaving brush contain anthrax? Was a coin fashioned from a brooch real or not, and which was worst? Customs attempted then to control the uncertainty of their dockside location with a series of logistical imper imperatives for moving goods securely from ship to shore. A dangerous part in any journey, this zone in any port city is dense with regulatory media. You know, flags and flares and buoys and beacons and bells and anchors and quarantine buntings and passport controls. The custom house added its own semiotic registers to this profusion of dockside media. These were primarily a series of logistical metadata for cargo handling, known as marks and numbers. So these were identifying inscriptions on containers to ensure that their contents made it to the correct destination. And these signs were then cross-referenced with documents like manifests and invoices. Let me just show you some pictures. So here, a consignment of corned beef which has been seized. And you can see on the side, uh, on, on each of those containers are the marks and numbers. Um, if you see that just under the ship, there's an N and an M. So that would be a mark, that those are the marks and numbers, and the same thing would appear on the cargo. Um, and then just here is a picture of army, um, French army customs, and you can see the mark and number on the side and him cross-referencing it. Now, another inscription that customs officers scrutinized was mark of origin, you know, made in England or made in Australia. These particular requirements arose from the Merchandise Marks Act of 1887, which specified that all commodities passing through customs bear a mark of origin indicating where they had been made. So just here, for example, you can see these goods were detained because they were not labelled. So the detention of goods not labelled made in England. Uh, the provisions of this act were as Byzantine as they were extensive, and by the early 20th cent century, subcommittees in London from the Board of, of Trade issued empire-wide instructions and standing orders on where these marks of origin were to be inscribed on commodities. So exactly where, you know, on, for example, where on hair combs the mark of origin had to appear, where on pure genetine this mark had to appear, 
way of picture and uh, greeting postcards, um, metal spools of typewriters, and on and on and on. So as you can imagine, there were many handbooks um, which instructed the exporters on how objects had to be inscribed with this mark of origin. And the designer of these regulations, of course, had to tussle with the shape of the object itself to determine where best it should be marked on the stem of the pipe, on the face of the clock, on every two yards of salvage on fabric, on the address section of the postcard, on the line of the bacon, on the flange of the, pr of, of the printing block, and so on. Um, and just if you're interested in the details, these are the sorts of details you get. You know, how, for example, you ought to mark your toothbrushes, um, and then if you ask that, some rubber boots. So, um, just very briefly, a further dimension of custom scrutiny pertained to the language and script in which the mark, in which this uh, information was to be conveyed. Generally, in the British Empire, uh, it could be any script, but there had to be Roman script as well. It could be any language, but there had to be English. But then you had to be careful because English itself came to be regarded as a mark of origin, and so you had to have counter indication to show that it had been made in the USA or made in Canada or wherever they had to have been made. So the core argument that I really want to make here is that customs officials' mode of reading was shaped by these, log by these logistical dockside imperatives. Copyright, as I'll, I'll, I'll demonstrate later, became treated then as a type of logistical media. Censorship became a mode of reading books more as objects and by their outward sign than by their content. The literary consequences of the custom house eddied outward, not only across the dockside, but at times into and under the water. Customs inspectors, as we've seen, dumped unclaimed, smuggled or banned items into the ocean, as did passengers approaching those ports where unlicensed reprints of copyrighted works were not permitted. So it was better just to abandon the book into the ocean than to pay the fine. So what happens when books enter this object, an ocean-oriented world? Ordinarily, in the case of an innocuous consignment of books, officials would not deal directly with the physical volumes, only checking the manifests and invoices against the marks and numbers. In 90% of cases, cargo would pass through without incident. In the remaining instances, consignments had to be stopped and checked. Um, in theory, such disputes were, of course, to be settled by the tariff handbook. Now, this process may sound uh, fairly straightforward until one actually sees a tariff handbook, invariably a volume of several hundred pages. In the British imperial world, world such handbooks hubristically promised to account for every object in the empire, if not the world, but in their very form acknowledged the impossibility of this task, since tariff's books were gen are very often interleaved so that you could write in you know, amendments or changes or whatever the case may be. One has only to flip through these volumes to grasp the intricacies involved in these customs decisions. So for example, just as you flip through at random, uh, through the H, you move from haberdashery to haggis to hair, and you can see the hair is then subdivided into no, no, enormous number of categories. You arrive at P, for example, you get palisade, fencing, palm, palm oil, um, pancake flour, pancake flour. Um, uh, and then, of course, always with the great bureaucratic let get out clause, EOHP, except as otherwise herein provided. So, disagreements, as you can imagine, um, both amongst customs officials and between officials and importers, um, keen to obtain the lowest duty on their goods, were routine. And each dispute generated a file, and so that the state archives in South Africa abound with such material as committees then had to adjudicate what objects actually were. So were, you know, soup squares the same thing as stock? Was Gloy, a brand of book, blind, book binding glue, the same as glue? Was there any difference, but as we've seen, between poppy seed and a packet, which could be seized under the opium laws, as opposed to poppy seed uh, for culinary use? Um, and fabric was particularly problematic, um, and many, many debates ensued about the nature of printed tartan versus gingham and so forth. So 
In the face of these contending tides of meaning, officials were inevitably driven to the objects themselves, assaying their content in detail through touching, through smelling, through tasting, through sniffing, through counting, through, through, through sampling and through measuring. They checked thread count, they opened cartons to weigh items, they tested alcohol to see whether its, its label in fact matched its content. So while the tariff schedule created confusion, it also had its consolations. One of these concerned books, which were generally classified with paper and stationery. And the Indian tariff phrased the matter fairly directly, so um, under a category called paper and its applications. So books were recognized as an application of paper. The South African tariff of the 1910s to the 1930s placed books in class 11, the category for books, paper, and stationery, with books hovering uneasily between paper and stationery. In class 11, books comprised only one of 16 categories, and they were crowded out by a demi-monde of paper commodities, mainly fro pro forma blank documents, like receipt folios, reminder slips, membership certificates, letterheads, and labels. Uh, when one comes to the category of books themselves, the tariff runs across three pages, mostly filled with empty volumes that resembled extended forms. Account books, birthday books, Boy Scout registers, diaries, exercise and copy books, school registers, cricket score books. Uh, where books were not form-like, they were all anonymously produced. Magazines, catalogues, municipal yearbooks. In these various look lists, books appear then as a subspecies of pro forma documents and were expected to behave in much the same way, you know, to offer ready legibility and rapid reading. Or as Lisa Gittleman points out in her history of the document, the form is something to be, um, quote, to be used but not authored or read. Even at the best of times, books were rather like uncooperative stationery. Books that were suspect in some way were especially troublesome. Not only did they occasion time-consuming procedures, you know, you had to consult a list of bands' publications, forms had to be filled out, um, books had to be confiscated and destroyed, in some cases being torn into small pieces by hand. Um, there were also the question of what to do with the content. Tax collectors at heart, customs officials were reluctant readers. They were, they were comfortable with the metadata of, of, of the consignment and the metadata on the book itself, but not its hundreds of pages of content. Now this book trouble caused at least one customs clerk in South Africa to complain bitterly. In a memo written in the 1950s, when censorship protocols were extensive and Byzantine, he noted that a consignment of harmless books would ordinary, ordinarily occupy no more than five minutes of an examiner's time. Yet once questions of content and censorship entered the picture, the task became labyrinthine. The exasperated clerk proposed a remedy, namely that the examination of suspect books be outsourced to inspectors from the Department of the Interior, which was then in charge of censorship, um, and these inspectors should be placed in each principal port. Quote, all the detail of examination and subsequent action could then be left to the representative of the Department of the Interior in much the same way as detentions for plant inspector, uh, veterinar veterinarian, health and health officers. So while his advice was not heeded, the clerk's view is telling in terms of the logics by which customs construed their task of reading. The content of publication is understood as a viral invasion of the paper, rather like a microbial disease that might insinuate itself into plants, animals or humans. As Deanna Heath's work on Australian customs indicates, officials there shared a similar logic. One Australian official complained that second-hand magazines contained such pernicious content that it overwhelmed the disinfecting bleach in the paper. Acquired in part via US networks that source discarded publications from railway porters and bellhops, these second-hand publications were officially excoriated. Um, that, much, that such publications might bear, quote, egg marks and other breakfast stains, as one Australian customs minister derisively pointed out, only provided further proof of their unworthiness. In such instances, the content of the publication, not to mention the egg stain, spoils a perfectly good piece of paper, while the decision to censor appears to be an act of solidarity with the paper itself. 
So as these examples indicate, the dockside routines of customs officials produced idiosyncratic methods of reading. They absorbed as, uh, as much of the book as they could into the field of logistical metadata, drawing the cover, the title, and the copyright, and anything else they could um, into this field. The printed object was apprehended in its entirety and judged by a range of material features. French novels were hence categorized as undesirable uh, simply for being French or on the basis sometimes of their illustration. So book covers provided an, another avenue for assaying a publication, with the offending jacket being enough to have the object banned or burned. In other instances, officials, officials followed a sampling method in which random passages from suspect texts were selected rather like an excise man testing a consignment of alcohol. Let's turn then now to uh, sort of drill down a bit to copyright and see how these dockside reading routine, routines shaped understandings of this legal instrument. So like most dockside activities, copyright was shaped by regimes of anxiety and insecurity. In part, as we've seen, this uncertainty was produced by the ecological, epidemiological and ideological ambiguity of the colonial port city. Yet with regard to copyright, there were additional complica complicating factors. The first of these concerned the conflicting and uh, contradictory levels of copyright legislation. So there was the empire-wide legislation, then there was colonial legislation for stuff produced in the colony, and then there was the Berne Convention, and no one anywhere knew which law was supposed to apply where. Compounding this jumble was the changing status of foreign and particularly US reprints in empire, especially the 1847 Copyright Act, known as the Foreign Reprints Act. So British possessions, or, or those, at, at least those who signed up for the system, could quite legally import pirated editions of British copyright work, provided that a duty of 10 to 15 percent uh, was paid by the importer, and in theory, remitted back to the publisher and the author. But of course, um, this very seldom happened, except in the case of Canada, which was touching the law-abiding. Um, a further factor creating confusion was who exactly in the custom house had authority to seize pirated material. In theory, it, of course, it was all customs officials, but legislation permitted booksellers and merchants to tip off the collector about their competitors whom they suspected of bringing in uh, pirated material, a process known as detention by information. On the ground then, it was unclear whether ordinary officers could detain falsely marked goods quote unquote, without previous information, or should they only proceed in the case of, quote, information by an informant? The Indian customs manual was blunt. The occasion on which customs officers should take action on their own initiative will naturally be rare. Um, so the situation, as you can imagine, produced endemic confusion. In Durban in 1915, customs inspectors seized a consignment of foreign reprints, reprints that included copies of Treasure Island and Kidnapped. The collector of customs dithered, should he seize the books in terms of the colonial copyright or the imperial law. While the book languished in the dockside warehouse, this query was battered between customs and excise and the Justice Department with no clear answer emerging. In another instance, this time in 1930, a customs official in Windhoek in what was then South West Africa, now Namibia, a German colony placed under South African mandate after 1918, there they seized copies of Lady Windermere's fan that had been reprinted in Germany. Again, no one seemed sure what to do. After much bureaucratic toing and froing, the books had to be released. Imperial copyright legislation apparently did not apply in mandated states, or so at least the Attorney General thought. So given this confusion, officials made things up as they went along. Drawing on their daily routines and protocols, they construed copyright as a type of metadata which could function as a sign of where an object had been manufactured. So they treated it really as a type of mark of origin. In this view, they were supported by the Merchandise Marked Act, Mark, Mark Act which uh, dealt with trademark, mark of origin, and trade description. Uh, this law also touched on copyright and indicated that British copyright could be taken as an indirect sign of British manufacture. So as a token of being British made, copyright functioned as a sign of propriety, 
especially in a context where suspect books might contain elements of obscenity, sedition, or racial insubordination. British co copyright then became a guarantor of probity, a sign that a book had been manufactured in Britain and was somehow respectable and hence safe to admit to the colony. In this context, uh, copyright became a type of eugenic trademark and a, a sign from the settler's point of view of implicit racial virtue. In some cases like Radcliffe, Radcliffe Hall's Well of Loneliness, one encounters a text that was copyrighted and manufactured in Britain, but was also obje objectionable. In these cases, customs may well have followed the logic long established in British courts that obscene, libelous, libelous immoral or seditious works were not protected by copyright. Seen from this perspective, copyright functions as a sign of probity, refusing to accredit and hence permit a harmful object to enter the market as though the copyright itself were a customs officer. So this logic of mark of origin resonated with other dockside regimes, most notably immigration restriction uh, procedures that formed a key node in policing the global class and color line. Those with the wrong bodily mark of origin were refused entry, while questions of writing and inscription were deployed as instruments of exclusion, most notably in the notorious writing and dictation test, by means of which would-be immigrants, as a condition of entry, could be required to write a dictated passage in a European language and in Roman script. As a type of racial trademark, colonial copyright surfaces an implicit racialization ins inscribed in the institution itself. Across European empires and in their metropolises, copyright was presumptively white. German imperial copyright, for, for example, prohibited Eingeborene uh, natives from holding copyright. While British copyright law in the dominions did not specify categories of persons, its imagined subjects were white and generally male. White women could hold copyright but had to indicate their marital status since this impacted on whether they could hold property. These assumptions had indeed, I think, been inherent in copyright legislation all along. To hold copyright, one had to be a free, sovereign, rights and property holding male, a category that until 1834 presupposed ra racialized slavery as its condition of possibility. Okay, so we're getting towards the end. So let me just give you a couple of comments then on censorship. So with regard to censorship, I think this dockside view opens up new vistas in terms of thinking about a sort of object-oriented reading. Uh, there are, of course, rich traditions of scholarship on censorship, but almost without exception, they share one assumption, namely that censors read the words on the pages in front of them. Very often they did, and in great detail. This story in the Custom House offers a different model where censors paid less attention to words than to the object as a whole. So this object orientation produces very different answers to the standard question of how censorship decisions produce definitions of literature. You know, so for example, how a highbrow text uh, is exempt from censorship, providing one index thereby of its status as serious literature. Okay. So custom censors produce interestingly mutant answers to these questions. So for them, a desirable definition of literature is when a book behaved like a form. Okay? It was easy leg easily legible, it was readily surveyable, it was designed for rapid use rather than extended reading, it was free from any taint of sedition or obscenity, and it was without an author. Um, Okay, these views then of copyright and censorship, I think, were uh, informed by a particular mode of reading shaped by the, ex this, the exigencies of cargo handling on a colonial maritime border. Items were be best read by the inscriptions on their outside coverings, and one did not expect to have to engage with the content of the container in any detail. Goods that were suspect or contaminated in some way interrupted the logistical chain causing problems as much by the interruption they occasioned as by the con contamination they portended. So it was a kind of case of con containerization gone wrong. Copyright and censorship took, took uh, shape within these imperatives, the former becoming a mark of logistical inscription and a, raci uh, and a racialized and eugenic trademark, uh, 
the latter a mode of reading that proceeded by scanning metadata and sampling. So it's a case really, I think, of what all largely censorship does, which it turns reading into logistics. So I think the apparently mu uh, mutant manifestation of these two institutions becomes visible as they enter the port city and cross the colonial maritime boundary. The term I propose for framing these processes in the book is hydrocolonialism. So let me just give you some, honestly, just headline accounts, and you can, you know, if you're interested in, we, we could discuss more. The term, obviously, is a neologism and has a wide remit that could touch on colonization by way of water, you know, various forms of maritime imperialism, colonization of water, occupation of land with water resources, the declaration of territorial waters, the militarization and geopoliticization of oceans, and then very much the colonization of the idea of water, turning water into a secular resource, and so forth and so on. So as a concept, hydrocolonialism aim, aims to create a more thoroughgoing intersection between post-colonial and oceanic approaches. With the exception of Caribbean studies, much post-colonial theory remains land-focused. Where oceans do feature, they constitute a conduit for human activity at sea, as we've seen more surface than volumetric depth. This project aims then to add water and depth to post-colonial studies, studies, bringing in oceanic themes where these are absent and moving below the waterline to complicate surface analyses. So the paper, the, the fuller, the full sort of um, uh, version of this paper then outlines four areas, and I'll just give, again give you the headings. It outlines a very, an emerging and very exciting field of techniques of people who attempt to go below the waterline in various sorts of ways, and I can expand on that. It, dis it, it also discusses the post-colonial imperative to move away from a colony metropole binary and to trace uh, you know, multi-directional empire-wide interactions, which is well known, and then talks how we might overlay this model with thinking about the hydrological cycle in and across empire. Okay, so to think about those two things together, to think laterally, vertically, and contrapuntally between different water worlds and hydro imaginaries. Okay. The third point, I think, it explores how to really think about water in a decolonial way, and the idea that I propose there is to think about creolized water. Um, and that's very much, I think, what I did in the opening sections of the paper, talking about, uh, you know, the creolized water off Durban Harbour. And then fourth, it asks what a hydrocolonial approach, and this is one of my particular interests, uh, uh, what does this mean for print culture and book history? And there is, of course, a very rich uh, tradition of scholarship on uh, the maritime circulation of printed matter, but this is very much a case of thinking about print on water. And I'm really interested, th can we think about print in water? And so I, I suggest then a method um, called books overboard um, to look at all the places at which books get thrown, books and documents uh, get thrown into the ocean um, and what we might analytically do with this information. So states, for example, often you know, um, dump sensitive, incriminating stuff um, in the ocean. Finally, just a really a couple of throwaway lines. Um, if I were to try and think about this in relation to public religion, I think there's some fairly obvious themes about the construction of the market and its theologies, uh, the ritual and catechism of bu bureaucracy, water as a medium in and of religion. Beyond that, I think I'd point to two areas that I'm particularly interested in. And I think the first is logistics, because it seems to me if there's a transcendent value or organizing principle on the dock side, it's logistics. Um, and so I think you could do things with that. The second, of course, is copyright, which is generally based on the secular religion of the inspired romantic genius, and it's the legal instrument uh, to achieve that. Um, although, as this account shows, um, once it starts to travel, uh, it changes its meaning very much. And I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Isabel, thank you so much. Um, that was uh, incredibly rich and uh, covered uh, a lot of material. Um, let me just begin with a question that I'll, I'll kind of to the audience. Um, uh, this idea of hydrocolonialism is, is very intriguing, and there might be some questions um, 
with respect to that. But um, it, it's, it's, it struck me that you know, part of what you were, that in the first few uh, sections of the paper, of course, the, the water and the, the maritime trade um, was, was central, but we're still dealing with what's on, on land, right? the, the, the customs house. Uh, situated right at the border, right, um, and that picture of the Durban Harbor um, over the 20-year period, um, I think, is a, is a really nice visual visualization of this this kind of liminal field or um, protein field being concretized. Um, and I, I, I really um, appreciated that, that, that juxtaposition of, of images. Um, I guess my my question with with respect to that is is um, on the, the 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 issues of um, censorship that, that you brought up and the ways in which I wonder if I can ask you to talk a little bit more about the ways in which the customs officials um, had to um, act as de facto censors um, and whether you know in, in the little work of Censors that I know, um, where there were kind of state officials who were um, specifically tasked with that. Um, what kinds of, um, I mean, were, were the, did, did, how did that play out? Because if there were censors somewhere, and I'm, I'm thinking of, um, you know, I mean, the literature on, on South Africa, in South Africa, and the ways in which the apartheid state had censors in place um, who were not customs officials, but kind of proper censors, if you will. Um, what, what, was the, what was the relationship um, between them? Or, what, or was that, I mean, was it a period of time where there's actually, um, where the apartheid state kind of came into its own, so to speak? Was it by that point that the, the, the dock side Customs officials no longer had to function in this way. Is it, is it, the, is it a question of the, the the apartheid state in this particular case um, uh, becoming institutionalized and, and very able enough to, to to perform this function elsewhere? Or um, so I just wonder if you can okay. speak a bit. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yes, I mean it's a very key part of the one of the thing interesting things in this project is that it tells a slightly different provides a slightly different genealogy of of censorship. Because censorship in South Africa quite you know, understandably has focused enormously on the huge kind of juggernaut machine that is set up under apartheid. And this provides a really interesting prehistory. And what I've realized is that it starts really during the Anglo Boer War. In Cape Town where customs officials work very closely with military censors. Okay? And I think they both sort of kind of ratchet each other up. Um, and so there's a very interesting, and that happens again in the First World War and in the Second World War. So there's a very strong um, trajectory then between military censorship and customs censorship. And I think it, it sort of reinforces that idea that they're thinking about leading as a form of logistics. Um, and what happens, of course, is also because the, the sort of South African settler set, set state is so sort of outward looking initially, you know, it's, um, it's very much, it starts off with the coast and then gradually moves out. That for a long time, the question of what is produced in South Africa is of very little cons you know, people don't really think of it. And the only, as I understand it, the only real censorship mechanisms for things in the Cape, for example, is some minor bit of um, municipal legislation. Um, so increasingly, and, and everybody sort of thinks about sort of printed matters coming from somewhere else. Um, so for a long time, customs really are the de facto censors until at least about the 1930s. And then it's the sort of early stages of the Cold War which shape that because then the anti-communist, you know, the sort of great anti-communist threat means that the Department of Interior starts to assert itself more. So then, you know, that that's kind of leads to a more, um, you know, sort of other structures being set in place. And it's also the rise of um, new technologies. So uh, 
sort of a forms, being that customs don't really have the technology to view the forms. Um, and the Department of the, uh, uh, of the Interior says something called censorship theatre, that new stuff. Um, and then the apartheid state takes over, and finally the really interesting thing is a uh, work by Peter MacDonald, um, who shows that in the early stages of apartheid censorship, especially through the influence of Africana literary uh, people, you first try and oppose the system and then try and join it, try and sort of mitigate it from the inside. That they try and sell it as um, in opposition to customs. And to say, look, these customs guys, they're, they're not professionals, they don't know how to read. we getting proper people now. Um, so. glorious uh, feast of extraordinary detail and provocations. Um, and I, I, I want to f follow up a little bit on this question about the moments at which or the kinds of objects that allow for customs and censorship to appear to be solidary institutions or in fact reduplicative institutions as opposed to those objects and situations where they, they seem to part company. Um, you know, the question of what, I mean, what, a, what a settler colonial point of entry is doing as opposed to what a metropolitan uh, adjudicatory system is doing seems to me to be worth separating out. So, I mean, if the question is whether the objects are pirated, that is, there's no proper recognition of the property rights of the author or what have you, that seems to generate one set of concerns. And the question about censorship, that is, is one receiving goods that have not been judged, that might, you know, that have not passed through um, the scrutiny of the courts or whatever, or is one receiving goods that have been adjudicated and being deemed offensive, obscene, seditious, whatever, I mean, whatever, you know, is this Ulysses after the fact, is this Oscar Wilde stuff after the fact, is this Radcliffe Hall? as opposed to things that would have to be read and adjudicated. I mean, these, I mean, I, I hear you arguing that at some point, insofar as it's an institution of logistics, those differences cease to matter for the customs official in a port city like Durban, whether that's the same as Cape Town. But are there times when that, 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 that does, that, that collapse doesn't take place in which one is um, concerned with the content of the object, the textual content of it, as opposed to its status as something that has already been judged, mm -hmm. as either failing to observe property rights or failing to observe propriety or whatever it is. Um, I think there were, and there were probably two kinds of cases. Sometimes, Sometimes there would be a direction from London in case of the Red of Hall. Stop anything. But the van itself was such a sort of extraordinary Byzantine bureaucracy, so they would also send out these lists. Um, you know, and, and it's, it's really difficult to understand how you could find anything in these lists. Um, you know, so I assume the list was there simply as a sort of authorizing mechanism rather than to be read. Um, so I think, it, so that was one factor. Then there was a lot of um, you know, it really was sort of um, ad hoc, um, from the ad hoc states. So it was very much driven by the nature of particularly the collector of customs in each port. Um, and very often you'd get the contradictory thing where one port would ban something and the other port would let it through, you know. Um, so it was a completely very decentralized system. It was very chaotic. Um, it was... Um, uh, it, it, but it, it was also very much, sometimes I think they would try and pretend, I, I, I really am interested in this idea of logistical reading because I think it's, it's um, um, the work that for me has been very influential on this is Leah Price's book, How to Do Things with Books in Victorian Britain, and she's got this really interesting thing about, is there any way that we can think about a book apart from reading it? 
you know, because that's the only thing we can imagine that one might do with the book. Um, so she's this is a very interesting book on the that question. So I think this is another answer to that question, which is um, there's another thing you can do with books without actually reading them. Um, and sometimes I think they would feel a bit embarrassed and try and pretend that they would read it. You get these sort of comical situations where if a book was particularly seditious, it would work its way up to the Minister of Finance because customs was under the, uh, was under Treasury. Mm -hmm. And then the Minister of Finance would print the whole So these are books that are not, haven't been adjudicated somewhere else in a court of law, for example. Some, like just a book that is not on any list. Yep. It's some customs guys, and well, maybe there's something in here that's really... I, I, I think it's the version of the cultural state. You know, you just decide, the official decides, I find this offensive. This is a French book, it must be suspect. Um, you know, and I think it is, um, I think the really interesting, if I could say, the really interesting part of this is also partly about, and it's a sort of universal thing that all s most studies of the state have very little to say on customs. Um, and so if you look, you, know, I mean, you must know the very rich historiography on the, sub, on the Southern Africa, on the South African state. Huge amounts of really, really interesting stuff. It all starts in the 1880s, um, and the, where, where it, and there's rich work on the poor city, but it's all about immigration restriction. Customs is the oldest part of poor city governance. Um, and I think the really interesting part of this is the, the sort of pastoral logic of it is that customs has huge amounts to do with slavery. So they are, you know, they often receive slaves, they count slaves, they go into the hold of the ship, they, they check the, the slave against the manifest, um, they hold slaves who do not appear on the manifest, they pay, and we get to know a lot about this, they um, parcel out so-called liberated Africans um, to friends and family. Um, you know, so I think that's also a very much interest, longer sort of genealogy of the the truth is we just discussed, I started to look at the stuff on containerization. Um, you know, and of course, which is both new in the 60s, but also has all these precedents. Um, and there's really interesting work there, a woman called Dara, Dara Einstein, who has written a history of a thing called the Bonded Warehouse. Um, um, which you wouldn't know about unless you actually did read about customs. Um, and she sees it as a sort of precursor of, this, of the economic free zone. Um, but so I think it is interesting, yeah, it's, yeah, interesting we started, started to come up to think about some of those long genealogies that customs have been Brenda Chilton also has done quite a interesting work on um, histories of Ghanaian customs. And in fact, makes the really interesting point that customs is always the one part of the state under neoliberalism that does quite well. Thank you for this. This is really um, beautiful. I also found myself sort of asking, um, what is the author of slow reading doing speaking about fast reading? <laughs> and so I think, so I have sort of two kinds of um, questions, just kind of thinking about the, the earlier book, the, the Gandhi work, and then this, and um, the, the kind of art that you, that you sketched out for. So I have two kinds of questions. So one, um, thinking about sort of uh, the question of property, and I find it very interesting that you bring up the question of slavery um, just now. Um, but I just had a, a couple of questions about um, about law and property. Um, and, and this is really just a request for information, but you talk about the Merchandise Marks Act in 1887. Copyright comes before that, by about 40 years. Then there was trademark, there was copyright, there was censorship. Each of these seem to be, these are not one and the same thing, right? Merchandise is about the object. Trademark is actually about the kind of organization company that claims, in a sense, the object and seems to have added value to it, in some sense, if I understand trademark. Um, the copyright is, is about legal regulation and the state and the, the ways in which the property form is being um, legally adjudicated and regulated. So these seem to, to involve very different kinds of operations or ways of thinking through um, law and property. And I wanted to just ask you to say a little bit about this, because so much of the talk hinges on thinking about the book as object, but also falling within a particular regime of 
property. Um, and given that you are speaking about a regime of property, where, as you say, you know, slavery becomes such an important way of thinking the person, the property aspect of um, both customs and adjudication and so on, the, the kind of related question that I had was, where is sort of labor in all of this, even with the dark side reading and so on and so forth, you speak about the dark worker and the last car. I mean, you know, there is a kind of labor even of reading, even logistically and so on. And there is a kind of, it seems to me, always already um, an integumentation of labor and relations of, of labor, even in this act of speedy reading and so on. So where, where does that fit into uh, this world? Thank, thank you so much. I think it's so interesting. I think this idea of, um, it's sort of, I realized um, that it's, we were talking about this earlier, that it's a sort of a kind of a rewrite of the Gandhi book because it's actually about interruption. Um, so I think there's a, um, you know, it's about what happens when this logistical chain is interrupted. And so that is very much Gandhi's project about, okay, that's a node at which you can go in. Um, and so I think there are really interesting things there about, you know, and, and of course there's a lot of, um, there's sort of, you know, theorization about this, that this is um, a, a sort of pol political, you know, this is the way to deal with the colonial state, with the carceral state, is to look for these nodes of interruption. I think there's quite interesting stuff also to be said about reading as interruption um, uh, and colonial forms of reading. If I can just say this, you can see in some ways this takes us back to a very old set of debates about colonial, you know, the colonial literature, which is sort of a, a bit of a what is real? Is the metropolis real or is the colony real? You know, is the colony a copy of the metropolis or is it something else? If it's just a copy, how do you create something new? And I think you can see this very much in, if you look at the dock side, you know, for them, the idea of colonial literature is you get a preset template and then you fill it out. You know, so, so it's a very nice image of what colonial literature was for a long time. Um, just on the law and property, I think it's so, I think they had very, as I say, this was the really interesting thing about this is that it completely takes us away from copyright, author-centric debates on copyright. So there's incredibly wonderful, rich, fantastic scholarship on the Euro-American front, but it's all about authorship, okay? These guys were not interested. They didn't care. What they wanted was that they held the book hostage, okay? It's the sort of logic of the carceral state. You know, they don't care who this author is. They're not interested. This is what I'm, it's the book. So this, it's, it's sort of, it's really interesting because partly, so copyright really takes hold in a very patchy way in colonial context. The only place where it really has any traction is in um, textbook markets. Because if you've got a very tiny or fragmented market, it's a right not really worth having. Um, and what you do get, the really interesting way is that people reinterpret copyright. So the other interesting part of the story is that African writers are extremely keen users of copyright because it's a way of constituting yourself as a rights-bearing subject. It's the one place in which you can claim something of a right. So, you know, they're very, people would claim often the highest form of sort of copyright that they could. Um, um, okay, so, and then just on the labour is also so interesting because two things. The one is, you know, if you read the Southern African stuff, especially on the colonial state and the port city, you get the idea that this incredibly slick machine, you know, it's all just moving along. Um, when I went into the archive, I thought this dockside is exactly like a university. They have these, all these little departments fighting with each other, you know, hammer and tongs. So the customs official is fighting with the harbour engineer who's fighting with the harbour master's office who's fighting with the port authorities who's fighting with the railways. So you know that was one interesting thing. And then the other interesting thing is of course that all dockside work is incredibly dependent on on the stevedores because most you know, until containerization, most cargo has to be carried. It's some part of its... Um, and so they're very interesting descriptions of how customs were deeply dependent on, Af on 
Afri teams of Africans who were then un unshipping, as they called, you know, unloading, and then the, you, you know there were these sort of hoist cranes, and it was very dangerous. So you had to. Re there was a guy in charge of this gang of workers who would be giving signals. Hands again, this sort of dockside semiotics. He'd be giving signals. Um, and everybody's, you know, life depended on all of this. So there was incredibly close connection. You read that customs archive, and it's as though they have, it's, it's, a, it's a miniature white empire. You, you, you know, you get the odd glimpse that there might be some sort of African dock workers, you know, but it's very much, I think, on the dock side, each of those miniature departments is trying to construct themselves as a, as, a, as a sort of empire, sort of the white empire in miniature. Thank you, Isabel. I, I'm, I'm always reminded how much I've known from you when you talk. And one of the things I got from this, um, just how an institution and how systems learn, how they teach themselves. And, and I, I see those in, in, the, in the examples that you've given us. Um, I, I have a question about labor as well. And that is the labour that was brought in specifically to, to South Africa for resource extraction and gold mines, Chinese labour, and, and then Indian uh, workers being brought into the, to the cane fields, and those are also then in that northern, that southerly part of the East Africa Rail Road. Uh, and of course, it's Gandhi's also the newspaper. What's so fascinating are the advertisements. And I'm, I'm wondering how customs dealt with the requests and the demands of the special needs, the special foods, the, that, that you, you see the mining companies, I'm drawing on Rosa's work here, the mining companies say, we need to make our mine, Chinese mine workers happy by giving them food that they know. And, and then you see something similar happening in, 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 in Durban. Uh, so that's one question of, of how that was dealt with. Um, the other uh, is that the Stevedores Union actually was one of the most powerful eventually uni un unions in the world, really affiliated with the International Labour Organization. And then, for example, in, South in Australia, they became very part of the organized crime, which segues for me into that underbelly of customs when things were not being thrown overboard but were being pillaged uh, at, at the port. At the, at, the, at the port side of landing where things were being squirreled away. I wonder how they, if that comes into your work at all. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, the question of, I've been trying to get a bit of a handle on it, but the, the, the way then when you move from slavery to indenture, what happens to the ways that customs interacts with people being shipped in? Um, and I think, although I'm not, I mean, I, I don't know if this is correct, but that the model of the protector, you know, the protector of, the, 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 there's this figure of the protector of various communities. Um, and I, I wonder to what extent that protector is sort of modeled on customs. Yeah, so, and, and I think so, and I think, that you know, and so, for, so in Durban, then there is the protector of Indians, and um, so by the time indenture happens, it's, it's, it, it then becomes a sort of office on its own. But I suspect again, if you take a longer look, that in fact, because the, uh, the collector of customs was the person who received bonded labour, um, you know, so any subsequent form of labour would, you know, sort of draw be modelled in part on that, okay. The smuggling question is absolutely central, and thanks for bringing it up. I, there's so much to say about it. Um, if I can just say, if you're really interested, the best, the, there's fantastic work by Andrew MacDonald. If you, if anybody is smuggling in Durban, if you're interested in it, it's really, he does fantastic work. And they also, smuggling, many customs officials were involved in smuggling. And smuggling entails quite a cosmopolitan cost. You know, it's got to move along a whole series of things. So again, there's this whole part of the shadow world of smuggling is the involvement of customs in smuggling. And just that whole dockside, uh, you know, sort of moral economy where the rice would suddenly break 
you know, and then it and then it was absolutely customary that uh, you know workers could take that with them. So, and that requires a, you know quite a sophisticated form of of, of, of cooperation. Um, and of course, I mean, the smuggling was just enormous. Um, and I think also it's partly the this, this, this sort of, you know, it's this argument about the nature of, it's a sort of Keith Breckenridge argument about the colonial state, the Southern African col colonial state, which is so patchy. You know, it's got this incredibly patchy sort of thing. So they're enacting this kind of great rituals of authority in Durban, but they, the customs officers themselves write frequently about how the rest of the coast north of Durban is completely open to smuggling, you know, mm -hmm. but they are so sort of invested in kind of, uh, you know, the sort of granular enactment of authority, you know, that's all that, they, that they're really interested in. Um, so I have a question on uh, Durban's duties, basically. Um, so I was, I was wondering how that plays into the story. I mean, maybe it's because I just completely misunderstand how the customs this works, but um, I wonder if there are like two sorts of imperatives for reading an object. So I very much like this notion of um, reading an object logistically from the outside and the book having a certain kind of intransigence to it, to the customs official. But I was wondering, because there's one sort of questions about the obscenity and about censorship and sedition and whatever, but there's also the question of how um, improper valuations are being spotted and drawn out um, by, by officials, um, because that seems to me to be a kind of different imperative of reading and another one of the imperatives that's necessary for a colonial system that's seeking to control the like, flow of commodities. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, that's an interesting, yeah, it, it would be an important part because how they authorised themselves was to say we are raising revenue for the state. So it's the classic fiscal military state. We'll raise the money for the wars, and then the wars will enable us to impose more duties. You know, um, so uh, and very often that would happen, I think, again by information. So they would be tipped off. Possibly, I think there's a lot of stuff that happens between uh, merchants. Um, you know, one merchant is shopping another merchant. Um, so that would be one way. They would also very much, you know, that would be the cross-checking between all of these invoices uh, and manifests and the, and the stuff itself. Um, a lot would be also there sometimes. It is also an interruption because you've got to go in and check and say, are there in fact one gross of toothbrushes in this, you know, this, or is it only... They're, they're claiming that there's half a gross, but there's actually a gross of toothbrushes. Um, so, so yeah, you, you, you're correct. I mean, a lot of a lot of that sort of work would 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 would, would have happened. Um, so, I was really interested when you were talking about um, how the British copyright came to be a sort of guarantee of probity in um, the works, and how it was a um, an instrument of exclusion in a way of policing the global class and color line. Um, and it struck me that that seems to relate to past work that you've done on um, the construction of British national and cultural identity, and in particular how um, that identity was produced through practices of, um, of literature circulation. So I'm wondering about if you could talk in more detail about this um, practice of inclusion and exclusion, and I'm also wondering if this, um, this particular function of copyright has any relation to um, Gandhi's personal um, resistance to copyright. Thank you. Um, yes, I think it is really um, in, just in terms of um, a, again. I think it was this thing that they were less interested. They didn't really have an idea of literature per se. I think they had an idea of paper and books, um, and they. So, so I think the idea. It would be much more, you know, for them, where did this book come from? What was its mark of origin? What was its metadata? Rather than any concept of the literary. I think there was just simply no concept. I mean, there, there, you know, why would there be? Um, I think also um, they, and you can see this, I think partly it also has to do with what is actually produced. So what we would identify as literary made up 
possibly about really 1%, I'm, I'm guessing, but a very small percentage of actual printed items. And what you do see on the dock side is you get a much better sense of that. You know, that most of printed stuff that's coming through is almanacs and all of those sorts of things. And you can see this a little bit in the South African copyright records are extremely broken and there's not a lot of them, but partly also because nobody took it terribly seriously. You know, it was... Um, uh, but there is one run of about 10 years from the Cape Registry of Deeds, so you can see exactly what was copyrighted. And this produced for me the really fascinating question, because you know, mo there is hardly anything that's literary, and most of it doesn't have an author. So it's, you know, handbooks on betting for the horse races, and um, uh, catechisms, and municipal yearbooks, and all of that sort of stuff. So it, it gives you a completely different sense of what is actually produced. Um, and uh, it pro raised for me this completely fascinating question about which was the first South African novel to be copyrighted in South Africa. And I think it's really, it's, and possibly I would put my money on an Afrikaans one. Um, I think might have been more likely than an English one. But so, so partly you can see, you know, the, the, uh, you know, it, it, I, I suppose it is, it's a sort of sociology of literature point, but that, you know, the literary itself would be tiny. I think there is something, the question to what extent tariffs create genres. Um, and in the South African case in the 1930s, you know, there was a real sort of anxiety about all forms of popular culture, comics and films and all of that sort of stuff. So there, South Africa uh, invented this term, or it was, customs had this term, the paper-covered book. So that meant, in their view, any trash, comics, you know, murder mysteries, all of that sort of stuff. And then there was quite a hefty tariff on that, um, you know, so that the tariff then was creating the, ca the, the category of sort of popular, popular fiction. Um, um, there was something else you asked. Um, oh, you know, I was so, I was so keen. You know that thing where you, I so wanted that to be the case. <laughs> I really, really wanted that to be the case, but I don't think it really was. Because I think the workings of customs were so sort of obscure. Um, although there is a very, although Ghani certainly was, you know, aware of customs, but I think that whole sort of copyright thing really, uh, really was very, uh, it was quite remote, um, you know, um, so I don't, sadly not. I enjoyed the paper as well, something for my, my oldest book, Originals. 14 minutes and it was in French. And maybe that was a way to get around that. Hmm. But my question is, being my grandma with the Paul and Chelsea South Carolina, is there any comparison? Has anybody done a comparison, analysis, compared to Durban and Charleston, South Carolina, or the reason for the 13th Amendment in this country? Have you ever looked at that? No, I haven't. And I mean, I, I, I'm not aware of any such commercial work, but it would be extremely valuable to do. Because they had, they had the custom house, very famous in Charleston, South Carolina. Mm -hmm. And some of the things that you say, the workers, the slaves, that's where they were <coughs> obtained. Yep. Mm -hmm. Custom house. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Your paper brought that up. Mm -hmm. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, I might have missed this, but I'm, I'm curious about uh, the history of the customs house. What, when is this set up? And, and, and what's the imperative? Uh, is it a simple uh, revenue imperative, or just, just gathering revenue for the state? Is it a military imperative or a security? Is it a political imperative, submission? Is it a commercial imperative, uh, preventing imports from certain parts of the world? So, because I know there used to be legislation about how imports east of a certain, a certain parallel were considered uh, unhealthy uh, and, and simply should not be permitted. 
uh, what was it? I mean, uh, did it have to do with slavery? Was it pre, post, during? Um, I can tell you, the Southern African story is that um, it starts under the Dutch, but they do not have a separate customs office, and it falls under the, the, the police. So it's, forms, it's seen as a sort of function of policing. Okay? And the British, when they in the first British occupation, then establish a separate customs house, and they bring in all of the, they model it on Jamaica. So they bring in all of the, you know, the tariffs and the regulations from Jamaica, because the, and the Cape from the, if you look at the Board of Trade records, the Cape is is, is um, defined as a plantation, okay, and it's 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 categorised from the point of view of Board of Trade, um, uh, and under that 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 rubric, and so until about and that customs house falls under the London customs house until about the 1850s, which which then becomes a, a sort of colonial operation. And I think, um, so initially, I, as I say, it's they, on their own account of themselves and in what they do is they, that they are the major generators of revenue for the colonial state. So that's in fact where the, in the early stages of the colonial state where most of the money comes from to conduct the wars in the interior. Um, I think also that they see themselves as very much an experiment of governmentality, you know, about how we're going to do this. And the really interesting thing is they all behave a little bit as though they're on a ship. Um, so if you look at those customs uniforms, they're all very naval. Um, and they have, um, they are very, you can see them, they're, they're slightly sort of envious of sailors. But sailors despise them because they are always preventing the sailors from smuggling. Um, and so they behave a little bit like a sort of a kind of like a marooned navy, um, you know, and they've got this sort of kind of like, you know, whole sort of homosocial ethic. But I think what they're doing is they're trying to think about how are we going to invent this authority of the colonial state. And one of the things they think is we're going to take the authority, the, the kind of dis the disciplinary strips, structures of the British Navy and try and reproduce that as one of the models uh, for the colonial state. Um, I, I, it was just a question about the newsprint. I was thinking the London Illustrated News maybe came through Cape Town um, and what's coming through Durban because these are different. So, uh, and I just wondered how they dealt with newspapers. News mm -hmm. in, in, in newspapers, that, that was also interesting. I, I think they, um, they were very, um, they try to keep away from newspapers because it was just too much reading. But increasingly as the early, the sort of early anti-communism starts to get going and then the, the, the sort of cold war takes off, they are, customs officials are really unhappy because they have to read all, because people are then demanding that they read the stuff. So they have to read Spark and, you know, all of these stuff. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, so, so it, but it, I think just on that point, I think it's a very, you know, again, that interesting thing of the newspaper um, and its relationship to colonial literature, because it's in the interruption, it's when the, when it's when the newspaper is not there. You know, the newspaper comes and you can fill colonial newspapers by cutting and pasting, but then there's a lull because the ship is, hasn't arrived and then you have to fill that, you know, so that's... Yeah. Um, maybe I can uh, end since uh, you graciously um, brought up some of the questions of public religion at the end, and I should make it clear when we agreed this uh, visit, um, Isabel made very clear that the work wasn't directly, even though much of her earlier work has touched uh, directly on religious texts and issues to do with religiosity. This work is not, and I assured her that, in fact, the nature of this project is not to kind of box uh, religion up neatly and tightly. Um, so it, it's, it's, I think it's very useful for us to think about in terms of a set of broader issues with respect to ideas of religious publicity. Um, but it, it, on, on, the, on the specificities here, I would be interested to know um, in terms of the, the, the books, 
coming in. There were there were three categories: literature, um, was it man manuals or um, school books? School books, that's right. And then the kind of everything else. Right? Um, it, th there must have been, uh, uh, but a lot of the texts must have been religious texts. Must have been Bibles, Testaments, tracts, hymn books. Um, uh, and I, I, you know, but I, I wonder. I mean, maybe with respect also to to, to questions of um, uh, food and the different communities in Southern Africa, there might have been a question of other kinds of texts coming in which were not Protestant, right? Um, do you have? I mean, did you find anything with respect to the ways in which um, religious texts? Might be understood in, in relation to that. Um, uh, what percentage, if you know, of these texts coming in were actually, um, you know, Christian texts produced either in uh, in, in, in London? Um, yeah. Any, any any points on that? Yeah. And then, sorry, just then one follow-up. Um, in terms of the, the 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 standards of judgment as to what should be censored. Um, I'm not sure how much detail there is in the archive or what kind of um, other materials you have, but it, surely much of it must have been either sincerely or insincerely based on a certain understanding of uh, Christian morality. Uh, and does that come come through at all? Okay. Um. Thanks so much. I've got very little sense of the percentage. You, know, you can't really pick that up on the customs documentation. But I think generally any Christian religious stuff in Roman print, um, in Roman script, was uh, duty free. Mm -hmm. so, um, you know, so again, I suppose that would have been some relief for the customs official because they could just sort of it through. Um, I was. I expected to find much more you know, detention, and these were the words they used, arrest, detention, seizure, of stuff coming from India. Because yeah, there's Niall Green's work, you know, Bombay, one of the printing megalopolises of the Indian Ocean, pumping stuff out, a lot of it going towards Durban. And I think what happens is that that must be being sort of brought in under the radar. Because I think this kind of logistical reading, the moment it sees anything that's not in Roman script, it's mm. alarm bells. Um, so I was sort of, you know, I was expecting to find more. And then there was one case, for example, a, 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 a consignment of 50 Gujarati books came through. And they didn't know what to do, and so they got somebody to just translate the titles, and on the basis of that decided what could go through and what couldn't. So I think, you know, in that way, they must have, going back to this question about whether Gandhi knew, I mean, there must have been this informal thing of just bring it in under the radar, you know, bring it in. Um, so, um, yeah, I think just, um, oh, the, the question then on w w was it informed by Christian morality? I think it was much more informed by military censorship. Mm. So you can see there's quite rich documentation for pro-Boer material that is seized during the Anglo-Boer War. And they read it like a military censor because they go, this passage will reveal, uh, you know, it brings the British troops into disrepute. You know, this, uh, you know, undermines the authority of the British army or whatever it is. So I think that's much more. And so I think, and as I say, it's that idea then that you're reading about, you're re reading logistically about where information is allowed to be. Well, Isabel, thank you so much uh, for an incredibly rich talk. And um, yeah, so please join me in.